Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to miss out on you all again today. Uh, I am continuing to test positive uh, from COVID and in such a way that um, makes it seem like I'm probably quite infectious. So for your safety, uh, it seems best for me to stay at a distance from you all uh, one more Sunday. Uh, so uh, hopefully this had better be the last one. I, I, I do miss you all. Uh, we begin with our preaching text. Our preaching text is from Numbers chapter 14, and first the gospel introduction. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Luke 4, 1 through 2. Now the preaching text. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness your bodies will fall, every one of you, twenty years old or more, who is counted in the census and who has grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness, until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Beloved people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let me take a moment to uh, uh, just go over how we got to this point uh, in our scripture reading. So last week, as you remember, uh, we were in Leviticus. Uh, so they were the, uh, the people of Israel were still uh, camping at Mount Sinai. They were receiving uh, the law, the commandments from God. They were doing all those things that would make them into a nation. And now, after uh, about a year of camping at Mount Sinai, the Israelites are finally on the move. They, had, uh, they have been organized into their tribes, each given their own responsibilities. They've built the tabernacle. They've received the covenant, all of the, the laws and commandments, uh, both over uh, worship life and daily life uh, that will allow them to live in the midst of their holy God. They have priests who have been ordained. They are ready, at least so it would seem. God has been hard at work for this past year, transforming these Israelites from being a group of slaves to being God's holy assembly, the holy assembly of God's people, the nation of priests, as God calls them. And so now they are finally on the move. And as we uh, maybe could tell from our reading today, it hasn't been going well. There has been complaint after complaint. In just the two chapters uh, of, of uh, the book of Numbers that have uh, gone by since they actually set out from the mountain of Sinai, there have been so many complaints. They've complained about how hard the journey is. They've complained about their food, the manna that they have been receiving. Oh, how we had all of the variety of foods we had in Egypt, they say. Uh, Moses or uh, Aaron and Miriam, Moses's siblings, have even been complaining about Moses's wife. Uh, that somehow Moses's marriage makes him uh, less capable of leading these peoples. It seems like all of the people would just as soon go back to the way things were. That even though God has done all of this to bring them out of Egypt, has been visibly speaking to them, leading them in the wilderness, they would just as soon go back to Egypt. Uh, to quote one writer, God may have taken the Israelites out of slavery, but it looks like it's going to be a lot harder to take the slavery out of the Israelites. So finally... In our text for today, they have arrived at their destination. It's been more than a year, probably, since they left Egypt, and they are finally on the edge of the promised land. Any parent who has gone on a road trip uh, with kids in the back 
can probably relate to the way God seems to be feeling, right? Uh, there has been a constant chorus of, are we there yet? Of, I'm hungry. Of, I don't like the snacks you brought. Of, you know, uh, my, my sibling is looking out my window. All of these sorts of complaints going on in the back. And God is just pretty close to fed up, you get the sense. God is just one step away from pulling the car to the side of the road and saying, you know what? If I hear anything else, I'm going to turn this car around. Except, as we hear in the reading, God actually kind of does it. God does do the equivalent of turning the car around. Because here they are, after all of their complaining, finally arriving at the edge of the land. And Moses sends in some scouts to go and see the land, to see what it's like, what its people are like, what the fruit of the land is. And they see for themselves that it is a good land. It is a fertile land. Uh, they bring back this cluster of grapes to show everybody else uh, to see, look how good the, the produce of the land is. The land has been good to the people living in it. The people living in it are strong. They've been able to build uh, large cities. Uh, some of them are renowned warriors that seem to have made a name for themselves, uh, even to this group of slaves who have left Egypt. It's a good land that God has given to them. And yet, here we also find that the people simply are not ready to trust that God will make good on the promise. That even though God has done so much to get them to this point on the edge of the promised land, when they hear about the bounty of the land, all they can hear is how strong the people in it are how there is no chance for them to make it into the land, how if they try to enter this land, they will simply be uh, turned on by the people that are there. They will be killed. Their, their children will be taken as slaves. And they say that uh, <laughs> quite, uh, uh, well, uh, predictive, I guess, uh, word of, oh, it would have been better, they say, it would have been better for us to have died either in Egypt or in the wilderness. Oh, that we had died in Egypt or the wilderness. Now, God hears this, and God is angry. God is very angry, because for all that God has done for this people, they still will not trust God to keep the promise God has made to them. God is committed to this promise, and yet, they will not trust God. So God says, fine, have it your way. You think it would be better if you had died in the wilderness? Then that's how it will go. Now, at first, God makes it seem as though he's going to just give up on the whole nation and say, Moses, I want to start with you. But Moses, of course, appeals to God. Moses appeals to God with those famous words that we heard uh, from just a few weeks ago when uh, Pastor Phil uh, Nesvig uh uh, uh, preached on Exodus uh, 32, I think it was, 34, uh, to us, uh, that the Lord is a God who is slow to anger, right? Abounding in graciousness and uh, mercy. And yet, who does not relent, or uh, who does not let the guilty go unpunished, but punishes the children for the sins of their parents to the third and the fourth generation. So Moses turns to God and says, uh, isn't this who you are? Isn't this uh, what you uh, should? Isn't this what you have promised to be? Uh, to be a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? Isn't it the case, God, that uh, that you forgive the sins even if you do not let the guilty go unpunished? And God replies to Moses. This is right before our uh, second half of our reading. He says, "God says uh, to Moses, I have forgiven them just as you asked. I have forgiven them. Nevertheless." Not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt, but who disobeyed me and tested me. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. So God is merciful. God is gracious. He does not wipe out the Israelites, though God wishes uh, to do that. But neither does God let them go unpunished. In fact, God turns the car around and drives them back into the wilderness. Forty years one year for each day that the scouts explored the land. And God says something else that uh, is a, a, even a little bit uh, disturbing for us today. Uh, God says this, Your children 
will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. Even though it was your sin that is keeping you now from entering the land, it is your children who will pay the cost. They will be able to enter it 40 years from now, but only after 40 years of hard living in the wilderness. Now we hear that and we don't like that, right? Maybe just as much as we didn't like this, uh, you know, God not letting the guilty go unpunished, punishing children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. It doesn't seem fair, right? That children should be punished for the sins of their parents. It doesn't seem fair that innocence should be punished for what others are doing. Yet this is simply the way the world works. We know in our own family systems that uh, things that our parents did or our grandparents did still affect us two, three, even four generations down the line. We know that in, in larger terms, very often people who have nothing to do with the sin that is committed receive some of the punishment when others in their community do something. Uh, we had an example of this. Uh, we have an example of this on the world stage right now, where uh, uh, in the in the battle, the war between uh, Israel and Hamas, where you have uh, Israelis who were killed brutally, innocent Israelis brutally killed, murdered by Hamas, and now Israel invading Gaza has killed more than a thousand, probably uh, Palestinian civilians. Again. The killing of innocent civilians is never a good thing. It's never uh, right. And yet they are being punished for the sins of those in their community. The Israelis who were killed are in a sense being punished, not necessarily by God, but by Hamas, for the aggression of Israel over the past century or so, and uh, Britain uh, before, who sort of set up this situation in Israel. Uh, the civilians in Gaza are being punished, even though they didn't pull the triggers, they didn't do the violence for the sins of their community as well. It's not clean. It's not even morally uh, justifiable, but it is simply the way the things that the world works. Some are punished for the sins of those in their community. Some are hurt by the sins of others in their community. Whether you understand it to be God exacting punishment on them or simply a natural consequence of what happens when sin festers in a community, it's just an accurate description of the way the world is, whether we like it to be that way or not. Whether it's something as big as this battle between Israel and Hamas, or whether it's something on a much smaller nature, like, uh, say, a football team not being able to play games because of the actions of some of its members, this is simply the way the world works. Actions have consequences, often for more than just the person who does them. So here Israel is, sent out back into the wilderness. Their long journey of about a year from Egypt to the promised land has just gotten 40 times longer. For 40 years, they will be out. If we had kept reading, we would hear that when the people uh, hear that this is God's judgment, that God is going to make them wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a large group of them say, no, we'll take the land. And they form a, a little army and they go uh, to try and take the land themselves. And of course, God says, don't go. I'm not going with you. And it goes terribly for them, as you could predict. They have to learn to trust God. Now, we have to learn to trust God as well. We have to learn that even though it seems like the forces of our culture are arrayed against us, for example, even though it seems like the future is so full of uncertainty and, and pain, that God is the one who goes with us. That even though we are here on the edge of a future that seems uncertain, a promised land that seems dangerous, maybe even undesirable, we go forward with God at our side. In a time when the church is losing its influence in the culture, in a time when uh, even the uh, basic understanding of what it means to be Christian is, is not something that most people understand or, or even are aware of or care about, it's easy for us as Christians, as the church, to lose hope in that future to see that 
all of the things we hold dear, all of the things we care about, the things that we have been raised to value might not last, might not be worth pushing for, might not be worth fighting for. And yet God goes with us. Now, this does not mean that God is sending us as an army, right? To go and force our values down the throats of all of those we can see. We saw how well that went for that group of Israelites who tried to force their way into the promised land after God said no. No, it's not about us taking action. It's not about us pushing forward and forcing it, but rather about trusting in God to deliver us, to see us through. It means to live not in slavery to fear, but to live with courage and good hope. For the God who knows us, the God who has guided us, and yes, even the God who uh, corrects us, disciplines us when we are guilty, is the God who has committed to our good future, who has promised to us in baptism, in communion, in the forgiveness of sins, to lead us all the way from here into the world of the life to come, to give to us everything that we need for the journey, even when we feel like things are scarce and the forces arrayed against us are overwhelming. So today, and all in the days to come, go forth with good courage. Know that the God who did get the Israelites into the promised land is the God who will get you to where God has promised to take you. Amen.